So, I mean, it's a great name for his channel. I, I like it. I'm not talking about it being a bad name for his channel. I'm saying that the trademark is descriptive at worst and suggestive at best. This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at patreon.com slash ljfrench. I wanted to cover this Tim Pool trademark application. What I'm showing you here on the screen is Tim Pool's actual trademark application. However, I have redacted his personal information out of it. If you have watched his video, he does complain about having to dox himself, and so I'm assuming that he didn't want to do that, and I'm not going to help dox Tim Pool. So I hope that's uh, I hope that helps you a little bit, Tim, um, because his his real address and phone numbers and things are in here, or at least somebody's real phone number and address. If, if you are a business, if you are even just a person who wants to not use your real address, you can go get a post office box or a mailing address from someplace else. Um, I'd highly recommend you do that, but that also costs money. I spend a hundred bucks or more a year keeping a mailbox in another place. Uh, plus I have another mailbox for the, for the law business, so that's like 200 bucks a year that you're spending just on mailbox services. It, it kind of sucks to spend that. I would really like just to have, you know, people not, we're not, not, I'd really like to have to not worry about people coming to my house because, you know, we would just know not to do that. But mm. I guess that's what happens. So this is a trademark registration. Tim Pool has registered or should I say applied for registration on the trademark Subverse, S-U-B-V-E-R-S-E. -S -E. And I watched his video and I've looked through his filing here and I have some concerns. I'm not saying this couldn't happen. I'm not saying his trademark is bad or anything, but I do, I, there are some things here that are concerning to me. If you're not familiar, Tim filed a trademark on Subverse based on his name of his YouTube channel, and I believe it goes back a few years to 2015, he's saying he's been using that name. And then comes along, at some point here, comes along Subverse, the Kickstarter uh, kickstarted uh, video game, raising 552, 53, this thing is going up massively every moment that we watch it, 553,000 pounds, which is, I don't even know what that is, $750,000 or more, um, from 17,000 backers, only 13 days into its 30-day uh, Kickstarter campaign. It is, they are based in Manchester, in England, in the United Kingdom. And it is, it is a, I'll, I'll use their words, explore a wacky galaxy full of hot alien babes in this kinky new sci-fi RPG mashup. Now, I, I, since this is Kickstarter, I'm kind of assuming that this is uh, at least an adult audience friendly um, uh, like a PG-13 audience friendly. So I don't think we're going to be seeing anything in here that is that is literally pornographic or, or prurient, but rather, uh, you know, right there on the line. The characters are definitely uh, somewhat sexualized. I'm sure someone would characterize it as hypersexualized. Uh, there does seem to be a gameplay element to it. It's a it's a space RPG of sorts. You can see some of the gameplay here, and then I guess in between battles, when you're when you're looking for some R and R, or maybe you're recruiting your people or something, you end up interacting with the waifus. Which, if you're not familiar with the term, as I was not, a waifu is a non-live action, sort of animated or drawn character that is meant to be an appealing character to a, a person in an attractive way. It's not literally spelled out as any sort of slave or anything like that. It is spelled out as a, here is a drawn character that a person can be attracted to in that manner is about the the nice nicest way I can put it. I'm not trying to be mean to it either, but I'm also trying not to get, you know, demonetized for the rest of my life on YouTube. So, uh, so they jump right into it. Demi here is an illegal bot. Uh, Lily is a renegade doctor. Uh, Kilisian, that's how you spell it or pronounce mm -hmm. it, is a pirate warlord. Uh, Fortune is a cyber criminal, and they are the waifus. Uh, so 
you can choose for yourself whether you want to support this kind of thing, but what I'm getting at here is that you may understand why Tim Pool is upset that their game is called Subverse when his YouTube channel is called Subverse and has been for a very long time. So let's then, seeing what he's concerned about there, let's go back to my uh, PDF here, my redacted PDF and scroll down a bit. So this serial number here means that it has been applied. His mark is subverse, S-U-B-V-E-R-S-E, and I've redacted out his addresses and things like that. His filing indicates that he makes entertainment media production services for the internet, entertainment services, namely providing online video games, news reporter services, providing entertainment information via a website. Now, I think that is a custom description. I think I th when you go into the trademark filing system, the trademark has to be part of an international class, which you see here is international class 41. International class 41 has its own description and it might not match up with this. We're going to look at that in a moment. So I think Tim has written this description, and the reason I think that is because he's paid a $400 fee instead of the uh, regular, the two, I believe it's $275 fee or $325 fee, it might have gone up, for filing in a standard international class as opposed to a custom international class. His filing basis is section 1A, which means he is using the mark in commerce. This is very, very important. A mark, a trademark only protects your use of the mark in commerce, and a, and a, and a, and a mark is only worthy of trademark trademark protection. It has to meet a bunch of other requirements, but it, one of the primary requirements is that it must be currently used in commerce. You can also file something called an intent to use, and there are a few other lesser used exceptions that I'm not going to go over because I really don't know them. So yes, it does say entertainment media production services, including providing online video games. Now, why is that important? Why would anyone care whether Tim has registered a trademark for video games? Well, Subverse is a video game. So if the two overlap, then whoever was offering uh, a, a, a protectable trademark first would be the one that gets the protection over the other. However, there's a second part of trademark where you only get protection for your use in commerce for the category of goods that you are actually using the mark in commerce to cover. So lawful masses, for example, could not be a trademark for groceries, could not be a trademark for food delivery services, unless I'm actually doing that and calling the service lawful masses, which would make almost no sense. Mm -hmm. Lawful masses makes a lot more sense when it's used in connection with providing uh, news services. And then, and then you have different levels of trademark protection known as trademark distinctiveness. Um, there are four levels of trademark distinctiveness. Let me pull this up here. So trademarks protection level or, or the amount of, of protection that a, a trademark is given compared to other marks changes depending upon how distinctive the mark is. Apple computer or Xerox copiers are much more distinctive than Bob's garage, assuming that Bob's garage is actually describing a auto mechanic garage owned by Bob. Now, if Bob's garage was used to describe a hospital for humans, that would be a little bit less uh, of a of a issue and it might be descript it might, might be worthy of higher trademark protection than a merely descriptive mark so looking at this starting from the top down highest level of protection a fanciful or inherently distinctive mark is on its face prima facie on its face registrable it comprises an entirely invented or fanciful sign. Kodak, for example, has no meaning as related to cameras until Kodak, the company, started selling cameras under that name or photographic services or goods or whatever. Then there's arbitrary marks, for example, using a real word, Apple, to describe computers. 
nobody would associate apples with computers until apple computers started selling computers under the name so they used it in commerce and therefore they were able to obtain a trademark Trademark protection is not just trademark registration, but for all intents and purposes, we're really talking about the uh, federal trademark registration and, uh, and, and legal requirements and all that. There are such a thing as state common law trademarks, and you can get protection for your mark, even if you didn't register it with the federal government. We're not covering that here. That's a very rare thing to do. But, but for the record, Tim probably has some kind of state law trademark in New Jersey, if that's where he's based. Um, or possibly even nationwide, but he would need to enforce those trademarks in each state with a state law, which is why we use federal law, because then you don't have to do that. So a suggestive mark would be like, or excuse me, a, a arbitrary mark would be like Apple computers, a mark which consists of images or has some dictionary meaning before being adopted, but which are used in connection with unrelated services. Uh, Tim has said that subverse is not a real word, and therefore should be given a higher level of trademark protection. We'll go over that in a moment. A suggestive mark tends to suggest the nature or quality of the service. It's more than descriptive. So again, Bob's garage kind of describes a garage owned by Bob, whereas uh, something more than that, um, maybe serve Bob. Like we're going to service by Bob, but we're going to stretch it. We're going to squeeze it together and call it serve Bob or, you know, some, something, something like that. The, the people do with the Internet these days or add an I or an E or something, you know, I garage or E garage or something like that is going to be quite suggestive of what's going on. The example given here is Blu-ray for technology that reads data off of a disc using a blue laser. The Blu-ray player is not the trademark. When you buy a Blu-ray player, you are buying a player that incorporates trademarked Blu-ray technology. And since the ray is blue and the laser is a ray, well, that's suggestive. We're not, n nobody, even though they took the E off of blue, it is still suggestive of the technology. Um, now, I'm not sure if Blu-ray actually went through an opposition or went through a, um, a court action on the thing. If it did, then maybe we'd find out more whether a judge thinks it's arbitrary or suggestive because they took the E off of Blue. But let's just pretend that, that, that we're agreeing with this level of, of, of protection here, that Blu-ray is suggestive because it is a blue laser, um, just for our academic purposes. Then there's descriptive marks, like I said, Bob's Garage, Bob describe it, it describes it. It could even be considered generic, but at least it says who and where it's from. So that, that could be a descriptive trademark. Descriptive marks don't generally get trademark protection until the market recognizes the protection or recognizes the use in commerce. So if I go out and I open Bob's garage and I'm Bob and, and I open a garage and it's literally a auto mechanics garage or something, um, because remember there's the Bob's garage as a hospital might be something more. Mm -hmm. If I go out and do that, I don't automatically have a trademark. If I advertise Bob's Garage and people begin recognizing that when you say Bob's Garage in this geographical region or on this internet site or whatever, and if Google searches start showing up and all that for Bob's Garage when people type in Bob's Garage, you know, all this stuff reinforces that Bob has recognition in the community and the market for his use in commerce. Now, Bob can get a trademark there's a threshold, but at some point there, Bob can get a trademark. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that gets this kind of protection, but I'm sure they're they're out there. Um, uh, electronic was famously refused. Here we go. Electronic was famously refused protection by the USPTO. Oh, I do have an example. We have our example. I, I have registered the lawyer simulator trademark as an intent to use trademark, and we have been denied because our lawyer simulator trademark is merely descriptive of what I'm making, a video game that simulates the feeling of being a lawyer. Okay, I think I still deserve some kind of protection for that, but I'm going to talk to my own trademark attorney about that, and we're going to, we're going to work on that. And I do own LawyerSimulator.com, so I think that's also half the battle. 
However, that's a good point, a good time to bring up a very, very important point. A website, or should I, I'll, I'll limit it to, a domain name is not automatically trademark protected. And a domain name doesn't mean anything to the USPTO as far as justifying your use of a trademark. So the fact that I own LawyerSimulator.com does not mean that I automatically get a trademark on Lawyer Simulator. I actually have to put content on the site. I have to use it in commerce. In this case, I filed an intent to use. I still have a few months to, to fight them on it, but we'll, we'll work on that separately. And then once it's established, it should be much easier to file for a trademark if if it's truly considered merely descriptive. Nissan Motors versus Nissan Computers is a good example, Jabberwocky. If you go to Nissan.com, N-I-S-S-A-N, -S -S you will notice that it is not owned or controlled by Nissan the Car Company. Even though Nissan the Car Company is quite worldwide and no one would really ever confuse Nissan, if you said Nissan, no one would ever think you meant the computer company. But there is a computer company called Nissan Computers, and it owns Nissan.com, and they refuse to sell the website domain to Nissan Motors, and there was a big court case over it, and Nissan Motors lost. And so Nissan.com is still owned by Nissan Computers, which has no affiliation with Nissan Motors. This is normal. This is this is normal in trademark in the trademark world. Uh, if you if you want to use uh, a, a word to describe your good or service that just happens to be used by another company, uh, but it's in a completely different class, uh, you know, like lawful masses for groceries. I can't stop somebody going and making lawful masses groceries. They can't confuse people into thinking the groceries are from the lawful masses YouTube news organization, but they can have their own mark and their own version and their own style and their own design and their own marketing and branding for a grocery store or grocery supplier called lawful masses i, I don't think that's a great example for you know what, what's gonna what someone would really do but then coming back to tim pool's situation you've got this problem with the trademarks let's go back to i guess the actual registration here so he has a specimen the the the, spe the specimen is is the is the is the um sort of the the item that indicates that you're using the thing in commerce let's see what he's doing there so this is his website so here he does have a website subverse.net and it does say subverse on it and i believe later in this pdf document in this application we will see uh, he posts a copy of a of a youtube video a, a screenshot of a YouTube video showing that the channel is called Subverse. He's from New Jersey, it looks like, and I even blotted out his email address in case that's not his publicly available email address. He paid $400. This is important because $400 is a specific fee that's charged for a specific kind of registration. Um, to the Commissioner of Trademarks, the literal element of the mark consists of Subverse, standard characters, any font, size, or color. It is International Class 41, again, entertainment media services for the internet, entertainment services namely providing online video games, news reporter services providing entertainment information via a website. In International Class 41, the mark was first used by applicant or applicant's company or licensee or predecessor in interest at least as early as April 4th, 2015. So that's important. That would mean um, someone who used it later in time might not get uh, get protection. Uh, is first used in commerce at least as early as 4 4 2015 and is now such used in commerce. The applicant is submitting one or more specimens showing the mark as used in commerce, etc. And, uh, you know, all these statements about being the owner and signatory and all that. He cites himself or claims himself as the president of his organization. That is what we call the uh, the image or 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 the, you know the mark the word mark that is being that is being registered. Here is the specimen. Um, this is a screenshot from his YouTube channel showing it. Uh, I don't know why the video says subverse, but then the description down here also says, or excuse me, the the channel name down here also says subverse. That's then his trademark registration. Let me bring up then 
what the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is going to show. So this is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website. This is the live copy of his application that we just saw, but I have come down here and closed these accordions so that we don't reveal his address and things like that. So one of the first things I see here is this date of application. This is a date of application of April 8th, 2019. That means he registered or, or applied for the trademark last Monday. Now, what did we just see with the Kickstarter over here? They're 13 days into their Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So he's registered this trademark possibly in response to noticing their Kickstarter. Now, that's not necessarily the worst thing to do. It's not, it's not bad or anything, but it's just a, a noticeable timing of events. Only after he noticed, uh, I'm alleging this at this point, only after he noticed the Kickstarter for the conflicting name, did he go and register with the trademark office? I think that will have some effect on any damages he might win if he wins damages from Subverse. However, there's, some, there's, more, there's more to this before we even get close to that. Let's see, going down further here, he claims the use in commerce is April 4th, 2015. The prosecution history starts on April 11th that the application was received in the trademark registration system. And no attorney, trademark staff information, no trademark examining attorney has been assigned to this yet. So this is literally about as brand new as you can get, literally six days ago. What will happen from here is the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office will assign an attorney an attorney trademark examiner who will examine Tim Pool's application, compare it to other trademarks out there. I can confirm that I did not find any other live registrations or applications for Subverse. There was a t-shirt or clothing company in California who had the mark for a little while, but it seems they abandoned it or canceled it in the 2000s. So the only live Subverse trademark application out there is the Subverse trademark. However, that's not the end of a trademark examiner's inquiry. The trademark examiner will look for other companies, other conflicts. They probably will notice the Subverse Kickstarter. Yeah. And then the trademark examining attorney will have to decide whether they believe Tim's evidence and argument and and first use in commerce date and they will either do what they did to us with lawyer simulator and say hey you've got a problem here and then Tim has six months to respond or the examining attorney very well could say okay yeah it looks like you're the first in time and you can go ahead and register this so also when I went to search for this I saw one entry on steam for a was like a certain three part series that you can download just to watch like a video kind of thing video kind of thing which okay. will also fall under entertainment which is under do you remember if there was a 41. date uh it was june 2018 june 2018 yes. okay and ewan's message says there's not in the us but there's a live one in the uk so i don't okay. know if maybe ewan could maybe send us more information yeah if you have a link ewan or something um or at least a, a, play, a way for us to get started that would be interesting um, the standard for a conflict between trademarks is that the trade the, the conflict has to be confusingly similar. A trademark represents a source indicator uh, for goods or services. And this is very important. It's not copyright law. We normally talk about copyright law. So if I sound like my own brain is going, huh, that that's because I'm used to dealing with with copyright law. Trademark requires use in commerce requires a category of goods, those goods, so you can't have a category of goods where you're, where you're serving one market, but uh, you're gonna try and register your trademark in another market. However, you are allowed to expand. So a computer company might expand into IT services. An IT services company might expand into web design, something like that. So you're allowed to have your trademark protection plus any reasonably close operations for expansion it is possible that a subverse youtube channel might go into video games however 
if he's only doing YouTube channels now and really doesn't have the intention to make a subverse video game, I think we have a problem. So what I was saying before about him paying a $400 fee indicates that he used his own custom descriptor for International Class 41. Let's go and see what trademark International Class 41 really says. Trademark Class 41 is Education and Entertainment Services. Education, training, entertainment, various sporting and cultural activities. Services consisting of all forms of education, persons or animals, entertainment, amusement or recreation, presentation of visual works, and chemical products used in industry. <laughs> so you need a little bit more of a descriptor there so that other companies know what you're making and selling. So this is the trademark registration with the UK's intellectual property office. Let's see there, they have international class 41 and 42 and 25 and nine. Nine is for basically software, computer games, etc. 25 is for clothing. 42 is for computer hardware for computer games. So this is a larger registration. First advertisement 10 of 2019. I don't know what that means. It's not, we haven't reached October of 2019 yet. Um, date of publication though was 8 March 2019. That's possible. What would 8 March be? That'd be right before their yeah. Kickstarter campaign. And the file date was the 14th of February. And they filed the 14th of February. And this of course is in the UK. Yes. So. The other thing is that trademark protection only protects the country for the countries that you've registered it for. So this is this is this is another uphill battle he's going to have if he's able to register the trademark in the United States. Well, he's going to have a problem with trademarks around the world. Um, if they have the registration in the UK, then they might have a problem with his registration in the States and vice versa. So what happens next? is going to be sort of interesting for us all. If the examining attorney, even if the examining attorney approves the trademark, Tim Pool's trademark, the trademark then goes out for opposition. It gets published to what's called the Federal Register, a massive collection of currently applied for trademarks, all the currently applied for trademarks, and that represents the official time when a competitor or concerned or interested party would file for opposition. Oh, the, is there, the crazy zoni is maybe it's the 10th week of 2019. That would sound about right. Yeah, that would be about right, middle of March. Yeah. So it is very possible that the trademark will be approved by the examining attorney, but then receive opposition from basically anyone uh, I'm not saying I'm going to file one, but even I could file one. File an opposition claiming that this trademark represents something that is outside of the uh, what's what's being used in commerce. And in doing so, one might say, well, Tim Pool does have entertainment media education services on his YouTube channel, but he does not make video games. Yeah. And if if the examining attorney uh, and the USPTO ultimately agree that he's not making video games, which I don't believe he is, that he might not be able to register that trademark with International Class 41 and a description of video games. He should be able to register Subverse as an International Class 41 Education and Media Entertainment Services but I'm not sure that he's going to automatically have the right to expand into video game services, especially with this uh, contemporary conflict going on right now. Mm. But this is not all. I have more notes here. I did have a, pr a little bit of a problem with Tim saying that subverse is not a word, because if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, it is a word. It is the verb for subvert. And subvert means to undermine or uh, undermine an established system or institution, undermine the power and authority of an established system or institution. It uh, comes from various different 
old English and French and Dutch and Greek and everything, but um, it is a word that is still in use today. It is an old word, but uh, it is not a uh, it is not a fake word. It is not an arbitrary word. It is not a fanciful word. Even if subverse itself was somehow not a real word, we still have subversive and subvert, which would be the bases for another word so to say that tim pool is 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 registering a a arbitrary or strong trademark is a bit of an overstatement i think the word subverse is somewhat descriptive maybe suggestive on that second level of trademark protection of tim's work um i know that he does a lot of uh, a lot of work criticizing politics uh, and other things. I'm sure that he does enter, basically does entertainment media services. That's that's fine. I have no problem with that. Um, and his channel is an underdog. He's got 364,000 subscribers, but he's a solo operation. He's a he's a one man operation according to his own words on his video. Maybe he has some people in the background. I don't know, but he's definitely not a major media conglomerate. And so if he is able to subvert the status quo, that sounds like exactly what he's doing. So, I mean, it's a great name for his channel. I, I like it. I'm not talking about it being a bad name for his channel. I'm saying that the trademark is descriptive at worst and suggestive at best. So I'm not sure that he gets to 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 make that as a uh, to use that as a, a protected trademark without first establishing it. Oh, there's someone saying his subverse channel has 90,000 subs. Okay. I must have been looking at a different channel. His, maybe he has another um, channel. I just wanted to say it's an old word, but it checks out. It's, it's an old word, but it checks out. Let him through. Let him through. Someone said they have a design company at subverse.org. Yes, that's true. Oh, here we go. Hey, hey, you want this one? <laughs> want that one? This is like, I will go for the bag. <laughs> she went straight for the bag. I will find the other fat house. <laughs> Nanny! Oh! That, yep, I don't mean, step on a cat. I didn't. <laughs> That's how you make friends with the cats. You give them jerky. Oh, we only just learned this this morning. I hope, literally, it was. this is the first time I've ever opened a beef beef jerky in this... You gonna take it? Here, you put it up there. And you want some more, huh? This one's a dog. The, the, the cow print cat is much more like a dog than the other cat. She ate my egg this morning. The cow print cat literally got up on, on Kaylee's breakfast and ate her egg. <laughs> right off of her plate. She was finished with it, but like just literally just like, hey, I'm gonna take that, by the way. <laughs> uh, oh, nice. So there was also a subverse user that, that was just pointed out. I had this up before for myself. Let's go over it. Uh, subverse.org is a design a designer writer who claims to write interactive narration narrative or consult on interactive narrative storylines and things for games. Um, again, though, having a website at a domain name does not give you a trademark. So the fact that this guy has subverse.org does not mean anything because he doesn't have a single re reference to subverse on this page. His name isn't subverse that I can tell. Uh, let me click on his contact link. Doesn't do anything for some reason. Um, but uh, he would not have a, a trademark on subverse just by owning subverse.org nor would tim have a trademark on subverse.net simply by owning subverse the trademark or or, or excuse me but just nor would he have a trademark by owning subverse.net saying things backwards if enough people have things called subverse doesn't it make it difficult to trademark yes if there's all these companies using the word subverse and no one has trademarked it that could be because they all consulted with their trademark attorneys and, and their trademark attorneys said this sounds descriptive of what you're doing um 
or maybe just not worth the money. Maybe their business efforts didn't include that in their budget. Those four trademarks, for example, would be $1,600 under the U.S. law if the U.K. company was to register them here. Likewise, I think Tim will also have to register uh, International Class 9 or something if he wants to make video games. He'll have to match some of that. So this is a this is a confusing situation. I don't think Tim really is making video games yet, and so maybe these two companies could peacefully coexist. Since Tim has hired an attorney, I'm assuming that there'll be some progress made there, and maybe we'll see a revised International Class 41 description from Tim, and maybe the other company will agree that the two can peacefully coexist. Obviously, one of them has raised money on Kickstarter in the higher six digits and as far as i know tim has not done that with a video game yet so one of them has some resources for this and one of them doesn't is what i'm getting at now tim could raise resources i'm sure that that he has uh you know we've used gofundme before i'm sure someone could raise resources to help fight for the trademark for tim i just don't see it as a as a winning battle I'm not trying to be mean or cruel or, or anything. Um, I don't have any problem with it. I'm just, I just don't see the, the circumstances under which it was registered and the circumstances in which it's being used supporting that Tim's subverse really is a video game. Um, much stronger for his actual YouTube channel, but I doubt, it's, uh, I doubt it's something that he's going to be able to register as a video game. So Disney, could I go register Disney as a media news organization? Disney doesn't produce the news, so I can go have Disney news, right? No, Disney is a sufficiently established trademark. It is, an, is a famous mark now, and so Coca-Cola or Disney or even newer trademarks like JetBlue, probably you probably can't go make JetBlue the grocery store because it's such a famous mark that everyone would think the actual JetBlue transportation company has expanded into groceries. What is JetBlue? Uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, airline in the U.S. JetBlue um, is a is a budget. Virgin Airlines. You couldn't you couldn't airline. go make Virgin groceries because Virgin Airlines and other Virgin media companies are so famous that people would automatically think that Virgin groceries was associated. Now I'm not saying it's not possible. We've seen some very conflicting trademarks and usually that's just because the companies allowed it or didn't fight over it or had a fight and the fight didn't work out for them um i'm not saying that you couldn't find situations where this would work but it's just good you're getting closer and closer and closer to uh, a famous mark as you get your business gets larger and larger and your marks are used more and more and more virgin is actually a really good example of what you've just said like disney mostly deals in um in media but Virgin does so many different things that that's actually a really good example of like a conglomerate multi yeah. multi corporation. So I'm I don't know about the search engine optimization arguments that I'm seeing in in chat, but what I wanted to talk about with search engines is that it is well established that you that that Google rankings and Google search results and keywords don't invoke trademark law. If no, <laughs> you can you do it. If I want to compete let's let's pretend for a moment we have legal eagle who is one of our youtube uh, fellow youtube uh, lawyers right yes. wonderful channel go check him out um if i wanted to compete with legal eagle i can advertise lawful masses on google search engine pages when you search for legal eagle I have to pay for it, and I'm not allowed to make my advertisement confusingly similar, but the keywords can be the exact conflicting keywords. I can use Legal Eagle's trademark as a keyword on Google advertising to then put up a lawful masses advertisement that is not confusingly similar. So how this would work is you would go to Google and type in Legal Eagle YouTube channel and their channel would come up in the organic results or whatever organic results would come up would come up because that's Google's thing. But then somewhere there where they allow advertising, you would see a sponsored advertisement for Lawful Masses with Leonard French. In fact, this isn't a bad idea. I might actually do this and he can do it to me. <laughs> um, 
And this is perfectly normal. If you want to go to Amazon, well, maybe Walmart's going to pop up some advertisements while you're while you're searching Google for Amazon. This doesn't pop up on Amazon's site. It pops up on Google search. That's not a violation. So the fact that subverse pops up by itself doesn't automatically mean that they're in violation of anything. It would be circumstantial or used as an argument that there is at least potential for confusion or that there's overlap between these words or something. But just because there's a conflict with the Google search results doesn't automatically mean one party wins or anything. And then a few other things to note, um, some of the cool ways that you can use trademark, for example, um, we've just learned that the country of Iceland is going, I guess, around the world is trademarking the word Iceland. No, they're battling and they're battling someone. Yeah. They're fighting for the right to use Iceland for everyone in Iceland. So that if you are a resident or citizen of Iceland and you're selling products that are based out of Iceland, you can use the Iceland trademark. Yes. So Iceland is currently fighting someone who's trying to register the Iceland trademark, I guess, in the US. In the UK, it's Iceland in the UK. store that sells frozen food. The Iceland store. <laughs> that sells frozen food. Can you guys see? I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you can see this. Yep, yep, yep. That's really happening. That's really happening. Uh, I love it how she like just wandered off and was over there. Oh yeah, she like, forgot about it. Oh no, she didn't forget. She's oh, trying no. to figure it out. Um, then we also have something that I've recently uh, come to love, which is Harris Tweed. Uh, this is this is a geographical and quality trademark. It's a certification mark. So it's not that only one company can make Harris Tweed. It's that if you make Tweed and it comports with the requirements of being made in the Hebride Islands and comports with the quality that is expected of Harris Tweed, then you can mark your product, even if you're not from the Harris Tweed company, which I'm not even sure if that exists. Mm. I think it's the Harris Tweed company would be the certification mark company. Yeah. And then they would, they would, they would be the quality assurance for the mark. Well, even to the Isle of Harris is very small. I would love to see more than one oh, company. There. Sure, I'm uh, yes, yes. The, geogra the geography of the Hebride Islands or, or Harris Island or whatever is are very small. So let's let's not beat around the bush there. But if you started a competing company and you met their requirements for location and quality, you could also mark your. You probably have to pay a fee for this too. Mm -hmm. You can mark your items with the Harris Tweed logo. And I have to say, this is a very nice jacket. And, and I'm, I'm very, very happy with the quality of Harris Tweed, which is why I looked for a Harris Tweed jacket specifically. It's like, you know, an Armani jacket or a, I don't even remember other design, or the Robert Graham jacket. You're going to get the thing you expect from the source of those goods, the quality of Armani, the style of Robert Graham, the Tweed of Harris Tweed is going to be of a quality that you can, yes, bourbon or champagne or scotch. You can call it whiskey. You can't call it scotch. No, and whiskey has two different spellings, one for Ireland, one for Scotland. Okay, that's interesting too. But you can't call it scotch unless it comes from Scotland and also meets the rest of the requirements for that, which I believe is aged three years and 40% alcohol minimum and, yeah. and, and such. So that's what a certification mark is. It certifies the quality of goods or services. And in this case, some of these are also geographic marks. There's also an update in another trademark case, the Pinkerton lawsuit against Rockstar Games. Um, we were literally at Rockstar yesterday. That was really cool. I don't mean we were in Rockstar. We were outside looking at the Rockstar building. Um, but the... Pinkerton security company had sued Rockstar for having used Pinkertons as a character in their game, which seemed extremely misguided. I'm not sure which attorney could possibly have approved this. This doesn't make any sense to me because the Pinkertons in the game, not only were they a fictional portrayal of a historical figure, there really was the Pinkerton detective agency which then went on to become the beginnings of the FBI, I believe. Um, or at least was it was a private detective agency right before the FBI was officially created or the, or the agency that was led, led to it. I forget my history a little bit there. And in 
the Red Dead Redemption 2 game, there it's an artistic creation. And there's there's no use of trademark. No one's selling Red Dead Redemption 2 as the Pinkerton game. Yeah. Nor are they selling it as a game from the Pinkerton security company. There would be absolutely no way you could get the two confused. So I really don't understand what they thought thought work was going on there. Well, they have finally agreed to drop their lawsuit. I don't know if there was any I, d- I doubt there was any payment, but um whether there was or not, I believe is secret. Yeah. And the lawsuit the lawsuit was was dropped. So that's the end of the Pinkerton lawsuit and the beginning of the subverse trademark situation. So someone asked, like, who's going to sue you if you call something champagne or scotch? So I know for Europe, because I done part of my dissertation on this, uh, there is trading standards and they actually do a lot of searches and testing in finding out if products are being ador- adorated. So the biggest scandal is being the horse meat scandal, where obviously the products that were labeled as beef actually contained horse meat, which is a type of adoration. And the same, like putting champagne on a wine that's made elsewhere in France, or maybe even Britain is also a type of adoration. And you can be fined with a lot of massive fines. And I know this is a lot more active in Europe, because I know I've seen studies done in America where adoration is a lot higher with fishes and they're not really pursuing it that much. But in Europe, they are pursuing it and it turns into huge scandals if it's found on purpose. So you can be paying a lot of fines. So what we're talking about here, one version of this is called trademark dilution. If you have a famous mark like Scotch whiskey and you don't enforce the mark, other people, you find acts of infringement and you don't pursue them or you, you let other people use your mark without permission uh, without without putting them through the service with the uh, the the certification process for example if harris tweed uh let any just anybody make their garments and call them harris tweed well that's a diluted trademark and the trademark can be invalidated literally you can lose the trademark because you didn't protect it so unlike copyright where you're allowed to let people pirate and you don't have to sue on trademark at some point if you don't if you don't pursue it attorneys can start arguing that your trademark is invalid that you have not sufficiently protected it that it is not therefore deserving of trademark protection general questions about geographical trademarks i'm happy for them to contact me on either twitter or discord and they can have a look at my dissertation where i've listed all the information okay kelly did a dissertation on um dna barcoding dna barcoding excellent so thank you very much to our supporters. This is a community-supported channel. Thank you very much to our supporters on Sponsus.org and Patreon.com and Twitch.tv. And even very shortly here, YouTube, we will also have the join button enabled. We, we did get approved for that. Thank you to our $50 plus supporters for the month of April. Thank you to John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mintain, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Aspernari, Snorri Wazatsky, Sean McNamara, and Atarik. Thank you very, very much for your support in the month of April. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters as well. You'll be scrolling on the crawl at the end of the videos that post that are made from this source material. We will post several videos of, of what we made today, and um, you'll be on there and in the description below. So if you would like to support us, you now have a new option, sponsus.org, S-P-O-N-S-U-S dot org. It only requires you to have a valid Stripe account. If you have had trouble with Patreon, you might not have trouble with Stripe, and you can use our system then. Thank you very much to Cerulean for creating that from scratch. Go visit that at Sponsus.org. If you would like to be a creator on Sponsus.org who has sponsors on that platform, please contact Cerulean at Cerulean hashtag 7014 on Discord. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. This is Lucy and Kaylee, and in the studio with us today is Brandon and Cerulean. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Love you all. Have a great week. Bye.